All right, so we'll get started. So welcome everyone and thank you all so much for joining um, us this morning. My name is Bree. I am the Health Promotion Coordinator for Arthritis Queensland. And with me today is a very important guest speaker, Professor Louise Sharp. Um, please feel free to pop your questions into the chat box during this webinar and we'll do a quick um, Q&A at the end. So Professor Louise Sharp is a clinical psychologist by training and led clinical services in the National Health Service in the UK in the 1990s before taking up an academic position. She is well known as a leading international expert in cognitive approaches to chronic physical illness in particular, cancer and pain. She has been awarded Distinguished Career Awards from the Australian Psychological Society, the Australian Association for Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, and is a fellow of both the Australian um, Association for Cognitive Behavioural Therapy and the Association for Social Scientists in Australia. She is currently the Pro Vice Chancellor, Researcher Training, and is in the process of developing a new graduate research school to better support the HDR students at the University of Sydney. So thank you so much for joining us today, Louise, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Bree. I, I thank you very much for inviting me to be here. I'm really delighted uh, to, to do that. Um, and I've been working with people who have arthritis since the very early 1990s. And so I really am very delighted to have the opportunity to talk both about some of my research, but also some of the um, approaches that we found have been really helpful over the years uh, with, with people. Uh, so as a start off today, I would like to start by acknowledging uh, the lands uh, and the traditional owners of those lands on which we meet today. I am uh, here at the University of Sydney on Gadigal land. Uh, and I would like to pay my respects to elders um, of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, um, as well as any in Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here today. And I also pay my respect to the elders past and present of the lands on which each of you might be joining us uh, today. So let me start off. I'm sure I don't need to explain to you, as I often do, how important arthritis is to us in Australia. You know, we currently have uh, 3.6 million Australians who live with arthritis, and this is likely to rise. We know that arthritis costs the community and the people that experience it uh, a lot of money in terms of early retirement uh, and cost to the healthcare system, um, and really is a very important area. And the, and the psychosocial aspects of that disease um, have really not been sort of front and centre of a lot of the care that people have had in my experience of working in the health services, both in the United Kingdom and here in Australia. Um, we know, for example, uh, so in this graph that I have, that this is looking at people who are diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis specifically. And it's looking at the number of people when you follow them up who develop a new case of clinical depression. And as you can see, people who have rheumatoid arthritis are at much higher risk uh, for developing uh, depression, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, in comparison to a group of people who don't have rheumatoid arthritis. So we know that depression is more common in rheumatoid arthritis. And in fact, that's really common across all sorts of um, arthritis. So rates of depression and anxiety in osteoarthritis, you can see that 19% in a big meta-analysis, so that's like a study that includes all the studies that have been done, show that people, uh, one in five people almost, um, have a clinically significant level of depression. Uh, and in fact, it's slightly higher for anxiety when we look at those people who have a high level of anxiety, um, just over one in five. So it's very common to have psychosocial um, difficulties as a result of, of experiencing arthritis. And that probably makes a lot of sense to many of you, I'm sure, um, who live with uh, these sorts of conditions. Now, a lot of the research that I've done that I'll talk about is going to talk specifically about rheumatoid arthritis, but rheumatoid arthritis is a really common autoimmune disease. It occurs in a, about uh, one in 200 people. And I'm probably telling you something you all know, but the 
primary symptoms, of course, are pain that people typically can experience on a daily basis and fatigue. Um, and we know as well that people experience warm, tender joints, inflammation, joint stiffness as part of that kind of present, presentation of symptoms. Um, and we know that when people do have depression or anxiety, that can actually amplify the symptoms for a variety of, of reasons that we'll talk about as uh, the webinar goes on. But we also know that many people with RA and other uh, sort of inflammatory arthritis is certainly can have systemic involvement that affects other um, organs as well, um, like the salivary glands, the glands um, uh, eyes, uh, lungs. And so actually, one of the things people often don't appreciate when they're looking in and don't experience the symptoms of arthritis and, and is that actually it has a much greater effect on the whole body, really, uh, than is sometimes appreciated by people who don't have arthritis. But certainly over the course of my career working in this area, one of the things that we have come to learn, which I think is a really good news story, is that early treatment is really, really important. Um, so we know that if you can get uh, the start of treatment uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, particularly with disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs, you can actually have a much better course, an ideal or even benign course of the illness. Um, and we know that the earlier that you get that intervention, uh, the start of the treatment, the better the longer term prognosis is likely to be. Now, when I started working in this area in the UK in the early 1990s, um, I guess my question was, well, that might well be true for physical treatment, because we really had just learned that at the time in around 1993, 94. But is it also true of psychological treatment? You know, can we actually work with people in order to be able to help them through doing some sort of a cognitive or behavioural intervention, not, only, not to treat depression that is there already, uh, not to wait for people to become depressed or anxious about their disease, but can we actually treat them to prevent the development of these kinds of uh, difficulties? Uh, so this is the trial that I'm uh, going to be talking about today, which was something that I did early on for my PhD in the UK. And it's a, a relatively small trial, but it's a trial of uh, people who, who developed rheumatoid arthritis. So people had to have symptoms for less than two years because we were really interested in early intervention. Because at the time, we already had a few trials that showed that CBT was effective for people with rheumatoid arthritis. But what it really showed us was that actually CBT might help pain and it might help depression and anxiety, but it didn't actually help with levels of disability, for example. And we wanted to see if we could actually uh, help in that regard. So the big thing that we started asking uh, was, you know, what would really be helpful for people to know at the beginning when they're first diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis that would help them to better cope with the illness? And we came up with largely three important components. And interestingly, um, in some research that I did with my team just a, a couple of years ago, we asked people who work in pain management and those who work with arthritis, what would be the key things that you must have in a cognitive behavior rule program that is gonna be effective for people who have uh, chronic pain conditions, including arthritis. And these same three things are the things that applied. Uh, on the one hand, uh, psychoeducation. People need to understand what is rheumatoid arthritis in this case or what form of arthritis that they have um, and what the implications of that are. People need to have an understanding about how it is that we come to experience certain emotions that we might have and how you can actually uh, work on those emotions and, and to try and modify those emotions if they are problematic. And importantly, um, the level of activity we thought was really important, uh, that when you have an inflammatory disease like this that can affect your whole body, uh, it's really important to find a balance between rest and exercise. So these are the sort of three key components that um, we included in our cognitive behavioural treatment, which I'm going to kind of go through exactly what that kind of looks like a little bit for you, for you now. Uh, so in terms of the psychoeducational component, we thought it was really important when people are first diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis that they develop a good understanding of the illness that, that they've been diagnosed with. What are the symptoms that they can expect to experience as a result of this? 
what are the available treatments? Uh, what's the course of the idea so of the disease? What are they going to expect in the future? What services are available to them? And how might they be able to do things that would help them to better manage their symptoms uh, in the short and longer term? So what I've done here in some of the slides that follow is to say, it's really pleasing when I was looking at the Arthritis website, uh, Arthritis Australia website in preparation for this talk, to see that some of the things that we thought back in the 1990s were really important are things that are now freely available for people, uh, you know, on the Arthritis Australia website. And, that, and that's fantastic. So, you know, what are the symptoms? I think Everyone, uh, lay people included, would know that pain is a, a, a really important symptom of um, arthritis, but people might be less knowledgeable about some of the other uh, things that they might experience. And what we found in our study is while people knew to expect stiffness or swelling or redness and warmth in a joint, that some of the general symptoms like tiredness, people didn't always realise was part of the illness. Um, or when they were feeling generally under the weather or unwell. And it's really important, I guess, for people to know that that's part of um, the illness because that helps them then to keep track of actually the level of, of, of illness activity. Uh, one of the things that is really crucial, as um, I was saying before, for rheumatoid arthritis in particular, is early intervention and disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs are, are usually prescribed quite early on. And I think one of the things that's really important for people to understand about these is, is how they work. You know, that uh, rheumatoid arthritis and, and some other conditions like ankylosing spondylitis, for example, are um, inflammatory forms of arthritis. Um, and when, they, when you take your DMARDs, it actually suppresses the immune system, which then stops the, the arthritis attacking your own body. Um, and that's really important in terms of slowing um, the progression of the illness. Um, and this not only relieves symptoms at the time, but really importantly helps to reduce the risk of long-term damage to your joints. And this goes to the point that we started with about rheumatoid arthritis in particular. One of the things that interested me most about this illness is that the first two years of illness are so important uh, in terms of getting treatment because we know that people that get to the end of the two years without having, um, you know, uh, erosions and so forth actually have a very good chance of not developing them and having this kind of ideal or benign course of the illness. So it's really important for people early on when they might still be accepting a diagnosis to know that there's some, what they do now is really important to how they're going to live um, in, in later years uh, with the disease. Um, the other thing that's really important, of course, is making sure that people are aware that there is a lot of support out there. Um, and sometimes in our um, health system, that can be really tricky to navigate. And I think it's really great, uh, certainly now, that uh, Arthritis Australia has very good information uh, on that that I've, I put up on the, on the screen. So these were the sorts of components that we included in that kind of psychoeducation, because one of the things that's really important, I think, if you're going to be managing a disease is that you really understand it very well so that you can work out the best way to uh, manage it. Uh, and interestingly enough, you know, Arthritis Australia now have this great uh, book, that 10 Steps for Living Well with Arthritis. And I was really interested to look at these um, and say these are many of the things actually that we really uh, taught patients in uh, this program that we developed in the early 90s really important to kind of take control. You know, we found that sometimes uh, patients would be quite devastated by the diagnosis, particularly people who were diagnosed very young, and they might actually kind of feel like there was nothing that they could do. Or equally, people would go almost the other way and really want to fight the illness. So they weren't going to let it get on top of them. And actually, it's really about how to take control but work with your disease, I think, and the symptoms to ensure that, that you have the best chance of managing it. Really important that people don't delay. You know, they need medical treatment and they need to think about managing as early as they can and to really work well with their healthcare team and know what their treatment options are. Um, now, some of the other uh, things that, that now are, are talked about in those 10 sort of tips, finding new ways to stay active, learning to manage pain, acknowledging feelings and seeking support, 
uh, making food choices that count, balancing your life and contacting your local arthritis office, uh, some of those we also included as part of this CBT. So kind of learning ways to manage pain, acknowledging feelings and support and finding balance. Um, so in terms of the cognitive components that we used here, um, this really stems from cognitive behaviour therapy. And cognitive behaviour therapy is a psychotherapy that was developed by the gentleman whose picture is here, uh, Aaron T. Beck. And uh, Tim, as he was known to his uh, friends, actually died last year at the age of 99. So he had a wonderful stellar uh, career. And basically what he found when he developed cognitive behaviour therapy for people who had depression initially is that when people had depression, they tended to see things through a lens of pessimism, if you like, that they would uh, interpret situations that occurred uh, in a way that actually led those situations to become even more negative than, than perhaps the situation was. Um, and from this, he developed an intervention back in the 1960s which kind of explained um, the way in which he believed that emotions uh, were developed. And so essentially what he thought, and actually there's quite a lot of evidence now to support, so when you're in a situation, so for example, um, you know, you wake up one morning and you've got um, a flare of your arthritis, you're going to interpret that, of course you're going to, and if you interpret that, say, oh, my goodness, this is really bad, this is a deterioration, I'm not going to be able to do anything, then actually you're going to feel even worse uh, than if you had a different way of looking at that situation. And those emotions then will also affect what you do. So if you're very frightened that actually this marks the beginning of things getting much worse, you possibly are going to avoid doing anything. You might cancel the plans that you had. You might stay at home. And then, of course, that's going to have an effect. And one effect that might have in the case of rheumatoid arthritis is that you become more stiff um, and less able to move and less able to do things, which, of course, will then confirm the beliefs that you have at that time um, that actually you are um, definitely getting worse and this is a sign of, of things to come. And those sorts of beliefs, you know, in some cases can be true, um, certainly aren't helpful but also sometimes are not true. And what cognitive behavioural therapy does um, is that through a really strong collaborative relationship with the, the therapist and the client, um, the therapist and client try and work out whether or not these beliefs that people have or these interpretations are actually accurate. So is it the case that having this one flare on a morning where you have particularly bad morning marks sort of a, a deterioration that's going to continue? Um, and is it helpful? And through that process of exploring those kinds of uh, questions, actually we help people to learn to identify thoughts that may not be so helpful to them, uh, patterns that they've gotten into their thoughts of overgeneralizing things or thinking about uh, the worst case scenario, um, and then actually developing skills to try and change some of those patterns so that actually when they're in situations, even if those situations are negative, they might be able to have a more cautiously optimistic uh, view. Perhaps today, for example, is a bad day and you might need to do a little bit less, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that tomorrow is going to be worse. What are the things I can do today to, to um, try and reduce the chance that tomorrow will be worse? Now, cognitive behaviour therapy now is an evidence-based uh, intervention for a lot of conditions, uh, particularly anxiety and depressive disorders. Um, typically, it's present-centred in the sense that it will actually talk about the kind of situations that you're in now. And sometimes, of course, the way that we were brought up, the um, meanings that things have to us do influence and are part of CBT. But usually our current experiences are a kind of bridge to thinking about where some of our beliefs might have developed um, and challenging those. And typically CBT is time limited. So in the programs that we've developed, um, the initial one, there was eight uh, weekly sessions with a therapist. And really CBT is, is a kind of educational treatment. And I mean that by saying what we're trying to do is to work with uh, people in, in therapy to actually help you develop skills 
uh, so that actually you can use these skills uh, in future to manage emotions that you will necessarily have as part of the illness because that's normal and natural part of uh, living with a chronic uh, condition. Now, one of the things that's really important is to say, actually, cognitive therapy and the com cognitive components of CBT for rheumatoid arthritis is not about putting on rose-coloured glasses. Uh, so it's not about saying, actually, that pain is nothing and I don't need to worry about it. I'm just going to continue and power on and, you know, no pain, no gain. Those kinds of beliefs might be more positive, for want of another word, but actually are not accurate in the sense that your body is telling you when you have rheumatoid arthritis and it's inflamed that you shouldn't be overactive on those joints. Um, you know, it is a good idea, for example. I remember working with somebody who really felt very upset about the idea that she might have to get um, a parking uh, disability permit to park closer to the hospital. And she was a hospital worker. And the hospital car park was about a 15 minute walk from the hospital. And by the time she would walk there, it was much harder for her to do her job every day uh, because she used up all her uh, kind of, you know, what she was able to do on walking to and from the car. Um, and actually thinking I'm going to be okay might be very positive, but it's not very helpful. What was much more helpful to her was to actually accept that it's okay to actually have a permit that allows you to park close to the hospital if that allows you to do your job better and to do it for longer. What the cognitive therapy component about is really about saying, and I'm sure you've heard this before, that there really are often more than one way to look at a situation. These two glasses could be described as either half empty or half full. And what we try to do is get people to have a realistic but optimistic view of uh, the circumstances uh, that they're in and of the condition that they're experiencing and the day-to-day -day situations that it throws up for them. And that's that kind of cognitive uh, therapy component uh, of the CBT. Um, and the final of those three components is that kind of behavioural component. Um, so we know that when people have a, a chronic pain condition of any sort, so this applies to all sorts of arthritis as well as other chronic pain conditions, that the activity level is very much associated with whether or not you're going to have a flare in your pain. So the more that you do things, uh, the more likely it is that you might have a flare in your pain condition. So if you tend to have a good day and go, oh, this is fantastic because now I'm having a great day so I can go out and do all those things that I haven't been able to do over the last week when I haven't been feeling as well. One of the problems that happens is that you might actually trigger yourself to have a flare. And the problem with flares is that they actually create this kind of bust where you have to have a period of rest and recovery for that flare to kind of resolve itself. And then, of course, by this stage, you find that all those things, perhaps it's things around the house, perhaps it's social activities that you wanted to do, perhaps it's work that you're continuing to do, um, that you need to do them again. And so people tend to, again, get into this pattern of being overactive on the good days, uh, but then needing a uh, to actually rest more. And what we find over time when people ad adopt that kind of boom bust cycle is that their pain actually starts to get worse at lower levels of activity over time. So that actually over time, what we see is that people come to be able to do less and less before their pain is triggered into a flare. So one of the things that we really try to help uh, people to, to learn early on in the disease in this trial was to really get into what we call that kind of pacing zone. So if you know that you can uh, do activities up to the purple line on, on, a, uh, on most days uh, before you get into a pain, painful flare up, we actually recommend that people bring their activity back a little bit so that they work at about, I don't know, 80% of that capacity. So that even on a bad day, you're not so likely to push yourself into the, the flare zone, if you like. So we get rid of this kind of overdoing it on a good day to keep people in that kind of pacing zone. And when people then aren't getting into that kind of bust 
place, this kind of no activity uh, down the bottom of this graph, then what we find is that, yes, there are good and bad days that so you still have to, you know, you can do more on some days than others. But if you can keep it in that pacing zone, what we find is that people can gradually start to increase their activity without actually uh, it uh, causing a flare in symptoms that you then need to respond to by pulling back on your activity. So we really spend a lot of time in this program working with people uh, to set very specific goals and pace in that way. So getting people to really choose an activity so it might be a walk or um, it might be a social activity to work out what's their starting point. So if you can walk for 10 minutes on a good day, but only six on a bad day, um, then we actually really want you to start working at five. And that's difficult for people to do because it feels like five minutes of walking isn't very much. But if the five minutes of walking every day means that in four or five weeks, you can actually walk 12 minutes without actually pushing yourself into the painful zone, um, then actually you can steadily build that up. Whereas if you start at eight, then you're going to be flaring yourself up on bad days. So we try to get people to work out what that good starting point is where they're not going to flare themselves up and they can really build up capacity. Planning when they're going to do it, where they're going to do it, how long um, and how they're going to do it, what they need to do, any barriers that they have, and then do a step-by-step, -step, um, setting smaller goals, monitoring to make sure that you keep on track. And as people are able to build capacity, then they can use those skills to other activities that they're having difficulties with. Uh, and this is part of that kind of behavioral component. And then the final part, I guess, of this behavioral component is really thinking about your values. You know, um, one of the difficulties when we have uh, activities that we can no longer do is that some of them are really important to us. And, you know, you might find that actually this is such an important thing that you're willing to put up with, you know, some pain um, for doing it. But sometimes there are other ways to be able to meet those values without having to do the thing that's causing uh, your pain to flare up. So, for example, you know, one of uh, the things that brings me the most joy uh, now is uh, playing with my young grandson. Um, and I'm sure for many of you that that might well be the case. Um, uh, and perhaps like me, you also are no longer able to go on the jung jungle gym with them or uh, ride a bike, you know, some of those more physical activities. Uh, but actually, I find my grandson loves to sit down and read books and do other things as well. And so sometimes it's about finding different ways to do activities that are consistent with your values, with things that bring you pleasure. And actually trying to find other ways uh, to do activities that bring you pleasure is really important because sometimes people fall into that trap of getting rid of all the things that are really truly meaningful to them. Um, and that really is something then that makes it very difficult to enjoy your life if you're not doing the things that you love the most and that are most important to you. Um, so we really try to help people to think about other ways that they can meet those needs if they're not able to do certain things any longer. So I'm now going to tell you what the results of that trial were. So um, here I've got two groups. So one group of patients, about 30 of them got CBT and uh, another group got standard care. And we followed them up over 18 months. And these are the results for disability. You see that of the people in standard care, uh, more than 50% of people got worse. And that's what we would expect. You know, rheumatoid arthritis can be a progressive disease and we would expect that the typical trajectory would mean that people are able to do less 18 months after um, they're diagnosed than perhaps at the beginning. With those who received CBT, however, less than 10% of them had deteriorated more than 25%. Um, so we really found that by getting in early and helping people to learn to manage the illness in this way, we reduced the proportion of people who were actually becoming more uh, disabled over time. Um, in fact, the proportion, a lot of people didn't get any better, but they also didn't get worse. But when we looked at people who were improved, we had two different categories. So people who improved a little bit, so uh, like at least 25% reduction in their symptoms, 
or those who are much improved. So these are people who had 50% reduction or more in their symptoms compared to at the baseline before they got treatment. And you can see again, the group that got CBT were much uh, more likely to have improved a lot, uh, whereas only a very small proportion, less than 10% improved a lot uh, if they didn't get the CBT. And remembering that all of these uh, people in our trial uh, were on uh, disease modifying uh, drugs, um, and, you know, this really helped uh, in terms of that kind of physical morbidity that people uh. experienced. We also found uh, that there were really good improvements in depression. Actually, I should rephrase that. It wasn't so much that people got less depressed when they had the CBT program. It was the fact that those who didn't get the CBT program actually became more depressed. They experienced more depressive symptoms uh, over time. Um, and as you can see, that gets greater the longer that we followed people up for. So we followed people after treatment at six months and then at 18 months as well. Um, and actually that also went for those who had clinically significant levels of symptoms. So in both groups, about 15 to 20% of people had um, a clinically significant level of depression at the beginning of treatment. If anything, it was higher in the CBT group. You'll see that in post-treatment, um, very rare for people to have had a, had a clinically significant level of depression. So about 15% of people actually went from having a clinically significant level to not. Um, and then actually there was no case of somebody having a clinically significant level of depression who hadn't at the beginning. So no patient that at the beginning was in the range underneath the clinically significant level of depression. Um, there were no new cases of depression um, over 18 months in that group. But you can see that over 30% of people who didn't get the CBT actually developed depression, like in that first graph that I showed you, uh, where um, that's the natural trajectory that we would expect if people weren't having psychological help. So... From that early work that we did, we really felt that, you know, CBT is effective, especially when given early and really can be a very effective treatment. But I have to say that in recent years, some of the work that I've been doing, interestingly enough, in the area of cancer has really led me then to start to say, well, you know, are there other things that we need to be thinking about as well? So I do a lot of work with people living with and beyond cancer. And this is a picture of the sword of Damocles. And this is something that people who live with and beyond cancer talk to us about all the time, is the feeling that when their cancer has been treated and they're now well, and there's no evidence of disease, that they feel like for the rest of their lives, they're walking around with this kind of thing hanging over their head that at any time might fall. And what this is, has been termed is fear of cancer recurrence, that people fear their cancer coming back or progressing. Um, and we know uh, that uh, CBT does have some effects for fear of cancer recurrence as well. But we know that there's another approach that actually seems to be more effective in these circumstances. So when people are worried about the cancer coming back and bearing in mind that for some people that will be the case, um, actually one of the things that is, is more helpful it are treatments like mindfulness that are not so much about questioning and challenging your thoughts, but rather understanding that we all have negative thoughts and we don't need to respond to them. So one of the things that quite typically we might do is when you worry, for example, about if you've had cancer and you worry about it coming back, our thoughts could spiral really quickly to what would happen if that was the case. And actually, one of the things that works better to treat fear of cancer recurrence is to actually not get into, well, is it likely that my cancer will come back or will it not come back, but rather actually to say, look, you know, this is a thought, having a thought doesn't make that true. I don't need to respond to it or to engage in it, but just to accept it. And this is something that kind of comes from more of a mindfulness type approach. Now, the reason that I'm telling you this, because I realise that you, uh, that this isn't about cancer, is that we've recently been doing some work looking at fear of progression in chronic illnesses other than cancer. And actually, people have not been talking a lot about fear of 
of progression uh, in illnesses like arthritis. Uh, but in this study that we published uh, earlier this year, we found that actually fear of progression is very common across a whole range of different illnesses, including arthritis. And interestingly, there are two studies that have looked at fear of progression in people with arthritis and people with cancer. And actually, it turns out that people with arthritis are more worried about their condition um, deteriorating or progressing over time, even than people with cancer. But we know for people with cancer that actually this is the leading concern that people have. Um, and so we were really interested by that and wanted to know, well, is it true also in uh, arthritis when people have these concerns that perhaps CBT isn't uh, the most effective treatment for these specific fears? And so uh, what we did is we decided that we would actually do a trial where we compared these two approaches for people who have rheumatoid arthritis. So on the one hand, we had CBT, uh, where, as I explained previously, we identify unhelpful beliefs, like pain means that there's more damage and challenge those beliefs. Um, and so we, in CBT, we examine those thoughts. We, it feels that they should be analyzed to see if they're true or unhelpful, as I described before. And we use those skills to challenge and develop more helpful um, approaches. Uh, now, mindfulness, as I said, is different because it really looks at the process. So instead of actually looking at those thoughts and trying to challenge them, it suggests to actually let go of responding to pain or unhelpful thoughts or feelings, but be aware and observe them, almost like clouds passing in the sky or leaves on a river. And what, what they, what it uh, suggests is that all thoughts, feelings, sensations are just neutral events that can be observed with openness and curiosity. Now, I have to tell you that I am um, a card-carrying CBT therapist, um, as Bree said at the beginning, uh, you know, uh, my home is cognitive behaviour therapy, so I was rather expecting uh, that CBT would outperform mindfulness uh, with people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which this trial is again. So, so I say that uh, in, in terms of, of letting you know, this is straight out of um, the results we finished recruiting for this trial literally only a couple of months ago. So let me tell you about it. We developed these interventions actually to be online. And one of the reasons we did that is because we know that access is a real problem for people. Um, so we know that mindfulness in particular, for example, is often given in two and a half hour sessions over eight weeks and then a full day workshop. I mean, this is really difficult for people to get to depending on where they live. If you have days where you can't make it, then you miss out on some of the intervention. And a full day workshop of doing mindfulness with a yoga based thing would be very difficult for people with chronic uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it also doesn't work for those people who live remotely or have work or family commitments or reduced mobility. So online guided interventions, uh, we know, are equally effective to face-to-face. -to -face. So we decided to do these interventions online. Um, we co-designed them with people with rheumatoid arthritis from already developed programs. Uh, so uh, we used a course called the PAIN course, which was developed by one of my previous PhD students, uh, Blake Deere at Macquarie University, and is based on the principles that I talked about earlier. Um, and then we used a program that I had developed with one of my other PhD students for people with multiple sclerosis. Um, and we took those programs and we went through them with people with rheumatoid arthritis. We got stories to make sure that they fit people's experience and were going to work um, for them. Uh, so the results of this trial was that we found that both programs were actually better than a, a waitlist control. So we had 304 people with rheumatoid arthritis who were allocated to one of these three conditions. And both programs were better for pain, so pain reduced, uh, pain intensity, as well as pain interference, uh, anxiety improved, depression improved, quality of life improved, um, and fear of progression improved um, compared to the control group. 
Uh, but we used people in this study, or we invited people in this study who had more chronic uh, rheumatoid arthritis and we didn't get improvements in disability. We weren't necessarily expecting that. And interestingly, we didn't get some um, changes in some of the process measures, which we kind of expected might be the case. But while both programs were equally effective for pain, pain intensity, anxiety, quality of life and depression, we did find that just like in the cancer area, that mindfulness was actually better for fear of progression. Um, and this was interesting because this was actually the only result that differed between the two groups was a result that favoured mindfulness. So I guess I like to think about this as a really good news story, and it's a good news story in the sense that what this is suggesting is that whilst we have a lot of evidence to suggest that cognitive behaviour therapy is very effective for people with rheumatoid arthritis, and there's also, um, incidentally, good evidence that that is the case for other forms of arthritis. Um, our study shows that actually online guided programs in mindfulness can also be equally effective and actually even more effective for people who perhaps have uh, real fears of their condition um, becoming worse over time. So I guess with that in mind, um, I was going to finish up and, and leave us to have some questions and, and comments um, to say cognitive behaviour therapy is, is an effective intervention. Um, my work is in RA, and so that's what I've talked about today. But there's lots of evidence in other forms of chronic pain and other forms of arthritis as well to suggest that cognitive behaviour therapy is really the most strongly evidence-based treatment um, for arthritis. Um, but there is emerging uh, evidence from myself as well as other people that mindfulness is also effective. Um, and I've put here the website, and I'm happy to make my slides available uh, to Brie for, for people. Um, and this has a link to MindSpot. So one of the difficulties in Australia is actually getting access to good psychological therapy. You know, we do have the Medicare um, supported for up to 10 sessions. But we actually have a workforce that isn't uh, trained particularly well, in my opinion, to work with people who have um, chronic physical health conditions. Um, and these programs are available um, at MindSpot. So not the ones that have been specifically tailored to people with rheumatoid arthritis yet, uh, but they will be once we finalise the results of the trial. So we, we've still got to wait for the six month follow up. These are just the post treatment. Um, but the pain course that we used to um, develop is available now. So if people did want to access uh, CBT remotely, MindSpot is a government funded uh, program. Uh, the chronic physical conditions component of that is uh, run by uh, Professor Blake Deer, who was a previous PhD student of mine. And um, that is available to people free of cost. Um, and you get an assessment over the telephone with a, a therapist, and then they call people weekly to ensure that you're doing well and, and to troubleshoot any difficulties that you're having. And I, I strongly recommend it to anybody that's interested. Um, so having said that, I just wanted to really uh, thank some of my collaborators. I just put up uh, uh, the place that I worked in the UK and, and these gentlemen, Tom Sensky, uh, Simon Allard and Chris Bruin, who worked with me there. And then my team uh, at Macquarie, uh, who are, are here led by Blake Deer, um, Joe Judney, Rachel Menzies and Amy Lee Cecil. And uh, certainly uh, this most recent trial that I've done has been supported by the Dor Dorothy Reevely Tinsley bequest uh, to do some work that would be really helpful for people with uh, rheumatoid conditions. Um, I hope that this work will, will be really useful and we're also using it to develop some interventions for children with uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So I'd be happy to come back and talk about that uh, sometime as we just start that work. So thanks very much and I'd really be happy to answer any questions uh, that people have or to uh, talk about any of the work that I've talked about today. I'll stop sharing the screen now. Thank you so much, um, Louise. That was really amazing. And for me, I learned so much as well. Um, I'm just going to stop the recording and then we can um, go and ask some questions. Feel free to um, 